Of course, all of this comes also as the two top leaders in Washington are in a standoff over raising the U.S. debt ceiling. Each of those leaders has potential problems within their own caucus. On Capitol Hill, Speaker McCarthy rolled out his long-awaited plan on Wednesday. He would raise the debt ceiling into next year in exchange for major spending cuts and the end of some very big Democratic priorities. But does he have enough Republican votes for it? Here's Speaker McCarthy Thursday. I want you to write stories like I'm teetering, whether I could win or not, and the, the whole world hangs in the balance. And then I want you to write a story after it passes. Would the president sit down and negotiate? President Biden immediately rejected the speaker's opening bid and took him to task. Folks, that's the MAGA economic agenda. Spending cuts for working and middle class folks, Americans, and tax cuts for those at the top. But Biden has an issue on his side of the aisle, a familiar one. On Thursday, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia blasted Biden in a statement for what he called a deficiency Democrats. in leadership and urged the president to negotiate with McCarthy. Some House Democrats echoed that idea that it's time for the president to sit down with the speaker. All of that comes amid the backdrop of what we've been talking about, that next week President Biden will announce his 2024 re-election bid. I suppose I'm supposed to say he's considering announcing his election <laughs> bid. I don't know. He's going to announce it next week. Um, let's start with the debt ceiling. Heather and Scott, I want to ask both of you what's going to happen here. Heather, next week, does McCarthy have the votes? He doesn't have the votes right now. Um, <laughs> he can lose four votes on the floor and pass it. Right now, uh, they're short of that whip count. They started whipping it yesterday. He's got some problems on his right flank. Uh, the Andy Biggs of the world, you know, want more things. McCarthy's saying, I'm not going to reopen this bill. It is what it is. And then in the Midwest, uh, Iowa and Minnesota, a lot of these guys are really nervous about the biofuels tax credits that are being repealed and how that looks. Um, and so now what they're kind of trying to do behind the scenes is see if they can give them something like an amendment or some kind of vote later on that would restore some of this to kind of help them go back and save face in their states. They do hope to vote on Wednesday or Thursday, but right now they're still short. Scott, I'm going to do a White House reporter trick and ask you two questions at once. <laughs> what does McCarthy want and how big of a fall will it be if he can't get the votes next week? What McCarthy's trying to do is drive President Biden to the negotiating table. President Biden has been able to just hang back uh, and not participate, not invite McCarthy over for these talks because Republicans have been fighting amongst themselves about, about what types of spending cuts they want to attach to this debt ceiling deal. And so the Democrats, the White House, President Biden feel like they, they are in a superior negotiating position. Uh, and, you know, we will see in this coming week whether McCarthy can get to 218, the magic number that <clears throat> had eluded him for 15 rounds in the speaker race he did get earlier there. this year. He did get there. He's saying he's going to get there with this Republican debt deal, but that only starts the conversation. The, the, you know, the, this, we're sort of in the chest-thumping phase of this negotiation, and both sides are trying to show how much power they bring to the table. And as Nancy Pelosi used to say, like our power is in our unity. And that's true in this case on both sides. And so they're sizing each other up. And at some point, there's going to have to be a com conversation. At some point, someone's going to have to cave. Both McCarthy and, and Biden have said actually defaulting on this is not an option. So there's an actual cliff here that both sides say they don't want to go over. Um, but, but where the you know, middle ground is found will depend on how, how strong they look when they come to the table. Nandita, there's a lot of doublespeak here. We talked about this earlier. I think folks might be confused by the White House stance. To take us through it where they won't negotiate, mm -hmm. but they will talk about something later. Right. How, what, how, what, how, what, what, and, do they, what are and they trying to do? You're absolutely right. So we've seen that sort of trajectory uh, when the president especially started with show me a proposal and I am happy to negotiate. And that has slowly sort of evolved into, well, I want a clean debt ceiling hike, take the risk of default off the table, and I'm happy to sit down and have a serious conversation. So there has been an evolution uh, in yeah. that position that the White House has taken on the White House issue. just wrote down the word evolution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. And, um, uh, I mean, look, the White House's position on this has been that this is a draconian proposal, uh, that, that we want budget talks to be kept separate uh, from debt ceiling talks. Uh, the president was at the Rose Garden just a few hours ago mm -hmm. uh, 
describing how uh, the spending cuts impact his climate agenda. Uh, the White House is, you know, on a messaging blitz. They are sending out a lot of information talking about how this impacts manufacturing jobs, how this, like, impacts the student uh, debt relief program. So their strategy right now is really premised around the idea uh, that the spending proposal will prove to be unpopular as soon as the consequences of this are spelt out clearly. Mm -hmm. And that is what they're trying to do. And also privately, the, the, the president is calling his, um, his supporters in Congress, Democrats in Congress, trying to keep the caucus together. So that is another sort of priority. Power in our unity. I know some viewers might say, wait a minute, we have until June, maybe September, for that X date, the date by which the U.S. government can no longer actually pay its bills. But Heather, is that, how much time is that really in congressional speak to get things done? I'm getting a little nervous, I'm going to be honest. I mean, you guys know, we've all seen Congress, they don't really do anything until they have a deadline, um, and they usually take it right up until then. The problem is, as you said, Lisa, we don't actually know when the X date is. Um, we expect the CBO to give us, we'll know something more from Treasury next week. The CBO will give an update in mid-May. But the House is out after next week for a week. Then we're into May. We're getting very close to June. I mean, it's very nerve-wracking, I think, on the Hill. And as you said, the White House is saying, I'm not going to negotiate with McCarthy until he passes something and agrees to put a clean debt limit on the floor. He is not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So there is going to have to be some acknowledgement from both sides that we are going to meet and we're going to give up some of these talking points, come to the middle, and find something that, frankly, can allow both of them to save face mm -hmm. in a way. I don't think either one is going to get exactly what they want, and we're just not there yet. Scott, you've covered a lot of this brinkmanship. What do you think an end game could be here? Let's figure it out, but well, what do you think? Well, you, the question I did not answer earlier was what happens to McCarthy here? What are the stakes? And this is really McCarthy's first big test mm -hmm. as Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know part of the deal that he negotiated with the conservatives uh, when he was securing that Speaker's gavel was to reinstate this motion to vacate where any single member can bring a vote to the floor to remove McCarthy as Speaker of the House at any given moment. If they don't like the details of this deal with President Biden, that could happen. And so McCarthy personally has a lot riding on this debt deal, as does the nation. Anyone else on the end game here? Do we see what? it yet, Michael? I think it's going to be like both sides have to find a way to maintain their red lines, but there is still a gray space here where they can figure out how to do that. I think another thing to keep an eye on is the, the plan McCarthy's talked about is a one year extension of the debt ceiling, which basically means in the middle of an election year, we'll be like naming a Republican nominee and we'll be doing this again. So that's a wild prospect uh, as well. Why, was, why is that beneficial to McCarthy? Why would he want another debt ceiling fight in the spring of 2024? I mean, Heather can correct me, but I think he's trying to get votes. I mean, they, like he's yeah. basically saying to the, his right flank, you're going to have a second run at this. Mm -hmm. We'll get another piece of the pie next year at some point. But it's going to be a very difficult position. Right now, Democrats feel very certain that the polling on this is to their benefit. And in an election year next year, they're going to feel even more certain. And whoever the Republican nominee is almost certainly going to be saying, wait, i got to figure out how to get to a general election position here. I don't really want to be defending a, you know, a, a, a collapse of the stock market right now. I always think in the end game, there usually ha there has to be a, a handshake deal at this point. There's not enough time for a full appropriations bill to make it out in terms of the debt ceiling. But these guys aren't meeting yet, so a handshake certainly is a far way away. Want to also talk about former about President Biden and his and his election announcement that we expect next week, um, Michael. I want to ask you why is the what? Tell me the thinking here, and why is there no marching band here? Why is it going to be a video? Uh, I, I think if you look back at how Obama announced in 2012, it's become more typical now to not start with giant rallies if you're a known commodity. What they need to do is set up a fundraising system. They need to start reactivating their grassroots volunteers. They need to start rebuilding their lists. They need to actually start building their own staff. They have to hire senior staff. They have to get a building, probably uh, in Wilmington, to, to actually have this going. And so they need something to get there. And then they can later in the summer or even the fall, do a bigger splash announcement. It, you know, when Obama announced in early uh, uh, 2011, 
you know, we st we, that was a video. It was grassroots supporters talking about how they're really excited to get back in the game. And then he kind of kept being president for six months or eight months before he was out on the campaign trail. So I would expect something similar to that, that this is just establishing a foothold. They can start doing the work they need to actually build what they need. Uh, and then, and then uh, you know, Biden can act more like a candidate later in the later in the cycle. And, and I just wanted to sort of jump in there. Uh, it also helps the president stay above the fray, right? Sure. As as everyone else fights out for, I mean, Republicans fight out for the GOP nomination, and that's sort of been the strategy of this White House and his uh, top advisors. Um, that was that is why they've been delaying this decision for as long as they have, uh, and and they've consistently communicated that there are no rush to make an announcement. And one other thing that I will point out is how different this is this is going to be this campaign specifically because the president ran the last one from his basement <laughs> right. this one he right. really has to show up he has to avoid those verbal gaps he has to be present he has to look sharp um, and that's going to be a challenge for an 80 year old president um, and so White House aides are sort of focused on um, on that strategy of how to sort of keep him going because he will still have a day job to do. How, how do Democrats on the Hill view this? Because this is still a president who he hasn't had a positive approval rating in a year. There's some enthusiasm gap with voters, but how comfortable are members of the Hill who are worried about their own jobs as well? Yeah, yeah Biden is underwater with voters uh, nationwide, but at the same time, Heather and I were up at uh, the Democratic retreat in Baltimore a few weeks ago. And Democrats, uh, Biden came to talk to them, but Democrats were very excited about uh, the prospects of four more years. Uh, you know, Pramila Jayapal, the progressive caucus leader who endorsed Bernie Sanders the last time around over Joe Biden, she was saying, hey, Joe Biden is the most progressive president we've seen in, in our lifetimes, uh, pointing to a lot of those legislative victories, the Inflation Reduction Act, infrastructure, gun reform, chips in science, the list goes on and on. It was a very productive uh, two years under President Biden, and, uh, you know, Democrats felt at that time they have a lot, had a lot to run on. And I will say one interesting thing I want to point out. I was talking to senior Republicans in the House and the Senate this week privately, and they both expressed that they think that Biden can beat Trump, and they're very concerned about that. And they won't say that publicly, of course, but they... He beat them once, and they are worried about that. In our last minute or so, Heather, Republicans, we know what they've been trying to do. They have been trying to really knock down Biden through their investigations. Um, has, has, have they landed punches yet? How do we see that going? You know, that's a good question. I think you talk to a lot of Republicans on the House side. They have launched a barrage of investigations. They've, they've tweeted something this week. They sent, they've sent hundreds of letters so far just in the first, you know, three or four months of having the majority. But have they really landed a punch so far? I don't think so. I think part of it is they're still very early. Part of it is the administration is not really cooperating with them. And part of it is it's so disparate right now. There's not really a common narrative yet of here's corruption here or here's this, right? So as, as it goes on, we could see something. But right now, it's just a lot of spaghetti being thrown at the wall. And it's interesting because over in the Senate, they're sort of just sitting and not doing too much at all. Michael? Last right. Time. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Senate's business seems to be these days uh, confirming judges and nominees they're missing uh, a key member of the judiciary committee republicans right now are blocking any way of temporarily replacing or probably permanently replacing diane feinstein of california who's been out uh with an illness and so yeah they don't have much to do uh, at the moment and i suspect that topic is of interest to our viewers and will come up probably in future washington weeks so